Corinthians, the 11th chapter, beginning at the 17th verse, and this reading from the King James Version. Now in that, pardon me, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise ye not, that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there is be divisions 
among you, and partly I believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, in, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall, I, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is of my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, he saying, he, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it, and in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the, blood, of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthy eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye not come together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. been said already, but I join in expressing my delight in being here to be able to worship. What a privilege that truly is. Every 
Sunday, I replay, I guess, um, kind of using a sports theme there, you kind of go to instant replay in your mind what you said and uh, what you could have said differently or better, and um, hopefully that's part of an evaluation process that helps with improvement. Uh, but one of the things that I do as well is I just uh, try to remember who wasn't present, uh, not so that I could be, you know, a tattletale or anything like that, but just to uh, think about who might need to be checked on or remembered in the upcoming week. And I know that there are many of you watching and listening tonight that cannot be here, and we truly do miss you when you're not. And uh, the thought just uh, crossed my mind when Brother Jonathan mentioned being able to be together to worship. Won't it be wonderful? In heaven, we won't have to look around and say, who's missing? Uh, if we've lived for the Lord, we'll all be together there and we won't uh, have any parting. Uh, there won't be any need for preaching even in heaven. Some might uh, say amen to that, but uh, you know, uh, there'll be the opportunity to worship God and give Him our praise, and we're thankful for that. And uh, after uh, a week that's uh, been challenging for our family, it's good to be with you very, very much uh, tonight. Tonight, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Mark. If you're visiting, perhaps, we're trying to study the Gospel of Mark, verse by verse and chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, sometimes even word by word. But looking at an exposition uh, would be the technical term for this uh, particular type of study, not trying to necessarily discover the meaning in each particular verse, but the overall theme and story that Mark is trying to tell us. Of course, he's writing by the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, and we believe that the Apostle Peter is assisting him with some eyewitness accounts. Uh, history puts those two men together later in Peter's life before his death, and uh, we certainly see some clues throughout the book that give kind of the fingerprints of Peter uh, in the book of Mark. And tonight, uh, we'll study in Mark chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 27 to 31. Then we're going to do something a little bit different from what we usually do. We're going to jump then to verses 37 to 42. Last week and the week, uh, the time before, we looked at the Lord's Supper and its connection with the Passover and what Jesus did to give it new meaning and new significance in the Christian dispensation, in His uh, New Testament covenant. And uh, that was very important in the reading that Dennis did, kind of echoed Paul's instructions based on what Jesus gave here in Mark as well as in the other gospel accounts. And so the Passover meal, now with the emphasis given for the remembrance of Jesus and the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, what we will call the Lord's Supper, we think has ended. And so they are making their way, our Jesus and the apostles, after singing that hymn to the Mount of Olives. And so it may very well be that uh, they're walking just through the dark streets of Jerusalem. We know that it was night when this uh, happened. John tells us in John 13 that as G uh, Judas departed, uh, John just adds a detail. It says he went out, that is Judas, and it was night. It was a very dark night indeed for what Judas was about to do. So uh, where this fits sequentially in the timeline, we're not sure, but it may be uh, that it follows along John 13 to 17 as these men walk uh, from the upper room to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, which was located on the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley. And uh, sometimes you can have conversations with people as you walk uh, that are much more uh, sometimes beneficial, much more impactful uh, than just trying to sit across the table. Uh, there is some research, in fact, and uh, corporate leaders are sometimes coached if you want to have uh, a conversation with someone that's less threatening, that might be more effective, kind of get them out of the office and just uh, take a walk. And that kind of puts people at ease. But what Jesus is about to say here will not put these men at ease. To the contrary, the Bible says, beginning in verse 27, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, to Jesus, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. They all said likewise. Skipping now to verse 37, we'll come back to verse 32 to 36 next week, the Lord willing. But verse 37 now and following. Then he, Jesus, came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, 
lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer them. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Three things jump off the page, at least uh, in my study, as I looked at it in an expository way. I noticed the forecast of failure that Jesus makes to these men. And it must have been a hard thing for him to say and an even harder thing for them to hear. I noticed Peter's response that it's faithful flattery. And you may think, well, those two words, they don't really go together, do they? They're opposites of each other. But I'll try to explain what I think the text is trying to get us to see in Peter's uh, affirmation and what we sometimes do in making the same sorts of mistakes. And then finally, we'll notice their fleshly folly. So those are our uh, kind of words for catchphrases, if you will, for memory devices. You can use them as you will in your notes or otherwise as we begin to open the text together. Noticing first the failure forecast, the forecast of failure that Jesus makes. Went a little quickly there. Uh, Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. Uh, he was well aware because it is written, Prophecy had earlier made this uh, prediction, if you want to call it that. The minor prophet Zechariah, we're still a few weeks away from studying him on Sunday morning. But in Zechariah 13 and verse 7, in a section talking about the way in which God would reprove His people. And it had a context that was related to their historical situation then, the time of Zechariah. But it also had a fulfillment that was secondary, what we sometimes call a secondary fulfillment that would happen much later. And now centuries later, in fact, at least 500 centuries later, probably from the time of Zechariah, Jesus said this is what he was talking about. This is the secondary fulfillment of it. That is that the shepherd, and he's identifying himself as the shepherd, is going to be struck and the sheep are going to be scattered. Uh, I've told you more than once about our trip uh, earlier this summer with our young people uh, down to uh, Brother Bobby Collier's sheep farm in Pikeville. And uh, it was amazing just to watch how the sheep interacted with him as the shepherd and the way that the sheep interacted with those of us who weren't. And uh, some of it was comical and funny and some of it uh, was otherwise, but all of it was very instructive. And it's true, you take the shepherd out of the picture and the sheep very easily become confused, agitated, and even frightened. And Jesus said, that's going to happen tonight to all of you guys. You will all forsake me. And uh, how that must have pained Jesus to say, in my time of greatest need, you're going to be the ones that I'm not going to be able to count upon. And this, again, was something that was predicted long before. No joy in telling these men that, but... Uh, because of their desertion, he knew it would happen. It's further proof of his divinity. It helps us know that Jesus went into the cross with his eyes wide open. There is an idea, and it's not anything new. It's been advocated for centuries that Jesus was just a victim of fate. And he was just a revolutionary. He was just overly zealous for his cause. And like so many others scattered throughout history, he just, you know, kind of got himself in trouble before he realized that the stem or the tide of public opinion stemmed and turned against him. And he made the wrong people too mad, too quick, and they took him out. Politics, governments, social movements, all throughout history have had that as a recurring theme. And some say, well, that's all that happened to Jesus, but nothing could be further from the truth. Peter will say in Acts chapter 2, you well remember that it was according to the foreknowledge of God, God's divine foreknowledge that Jesus was delivered up. The book of Revelation will even describe Jesus as the lamb. Here kind of switching metaphors from the shepherd to the sheep. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Even before we have time existing in Genesis 1 when God spoke the universe into existence, He knew this dark night would come. He knew what would follow on Friday on that hill called Golgotha. And Jesus here is telling these men, I know what's going to happen. And I'm well aware my eyes are wide open to this fate that I am facing. But notice it is a forecast of failure. And these men did fail. Well, in response to that forecast of failure, 
uh, Peter, as he often did, and as I said, this gospel certainly bears marks to show us the influence that he probably had in helping Mark compose it. Again, the Holy Spirit is the primary author, but uh, the personalities of the men involved, God used the Holy Spirit and these men and their pens to bring that out. And he does that beautifully here, and it even is a further proof of inspiration. The people that say, you know, the Bible's a book of made-up fairy tales, or it's uh, not an accurate history. Think for a moment if you were recording your life story or elements of it. What would you naturally rec uh, record? What would you put the emphasis on? Would you bring out the parts of your life that were embarrassing? Maybe you might do one or two. You might do a few of them just scattered about. But typically, most biographies and autobiographies, uh, even today, when we look at historical figures, uh, we want to highlight the good points. Now, sometimes adversity is mentioned, but only in passing. Here, Peter, uh, again, probably again assisting Mark in the composition of the gospel, doesn't hold anything back. And he's quick to make uh, an assertion. And it's what I'm calling faithful flattery. Well, you would say, but isn't flattery insincere praise? And it is. And we're all sometimes maybe, uh, you know, susceptible to giving it. When we want our way or we want something, uh, we can flatter. The boss at work or the spouse at home or uh, whomever it may be, sometimes we'll give praise. But we're not really genuine in it. We're insincere in it. Is Peter trying to flatter the Lord? I don't think so. Now, he's insincere without knowing it, but he's faithful in what he affirms or what he thinks he's going to do. And so the Bible tells us, Peter responds, and he said, even if all, remember Jesus said, all will be scattered. Peter says, well, all doesn't mean me. You ever felt that way? All doesn't mean me, Peter says. Even if all are made to stumble, they're the word for stumble, as Jesus had used it before as a reference to an idea of a scandal almost. Even if all are made to stumble, not me, I will not be. Jesus said to him, assuredly. Uh, I think the older versions use the word there, verily. It means truthfully, without a doubt. Peter, I know what I'm talking about. You can be certain that today, even this night, as the Jews reckon time from sundown to the next sundown, it would be within that 24-hour period, before the rooster crows twice, usually, at least at this time, the first crowing of the rooster they think was sometime around 3 a.m., the next one around dawn, around 6. But before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he, not content with what Jesus said, spoke more vehemently. Now, I don't know if you've used that adverb lately. I can't recall the last time I used it other than reading it or discussing it in a setting such as this. He spoke more vehemently. He's intense. It carries with it the idea almost of some frustration and even some anger. Jesus, you're wrong, is in essence what Peter is saying. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Now they join in, that is they, the other ten, uh, because Judas has already went out and so Peter makes 11. There are not 12 present on this occasion. Judas has deserted them already. But the other 10, and if there might have been by chance others with them, uh, we don't have any record of that. But nevertheless, uh, these 10 men, likewise with Peter, we are in agreement. We're going to die with you if that's what it takes. That's our devotion level. Well, even though he's quick to object, he makes three errors. And uh, these are the same three errors that all of us have from time to time likewise made. Number one, uh, most obvious, of course, he contradicted Jesus. That's never uh, a good choice. And uh, you can look at the times in your life, either by your behavior or by your outward actions, you've contradicted Jesus. God has said something and you've said otherwise, or God has commanded something and you've done otherwise. We've all been guilty of that. We've contradicted our God. And that's a very serious offense indeed. Number two... Peter considers himself and his faithfulness superior to others. Even if all, Lord, you're not talking about me, I know. All the rest of these guys, these other ten or how many ever are in the company, they might fall, but no, not me. I'm superior to them. Now, of course, those words don't exactly fall from his lips, but that's exactly the assertion that he's making. And then number three, the reason why he made that sort of response 
but making it an error. His flattery is faithful, but it's insincere. It's not genuine. It won't stand up when the test comes. Is because he put too much trust in himself, in his own strength. Even if all do that, not me. I, I know me, Lord. I know what I'm capable of. But here's the problem. And again, it's not a new problem. It still plagues many of us even to the present hour. Peter didn't realize, didn't understand that Jesus knew more about him than he did about himself. Do we know that? Do we understand that? Now you may say, well, what difference does it make if that's the case or not? It's going to come into play in the next point. And that's why the cautions that we read about in Scripture are so important that we take notice of them. Because God knows us better than we know ourselves. And that, uh, you know, goes across every front. When we think about we can direct our lives in a better way than God can, the wise man Solomon would say, No, you trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. That is, let Him lead the way, and He will direct your path. And so we have, uh, as we've seen already, a forecast of failure, the faithful flattery of Peter. And again, we understand how those ideas don't go together. But then we see their fleshly folly. Now they arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane in verse 32. And Jesus begins to pray. And that is such an intense and intimate scene. I'm going to leave it for the Lord willing next Sunday night and uh, try to take you, take us on a journey where we come alongside our Lord in that setting. And so it deserves its own attention. And I'm going to give that time next week to that. But kind of going from that scene, Jesus is praying uh, and he's praying and he has taken these three men, Peter, James, and John, his inner circle as they're often called. But notice uh, it's Peter that heads the list. And after praying, Jesus came, verse 37, and found them sleeping. It would have been probably, we don't know the exact hour, but it would have been well into the evening. It would have been the time when typically men would have been asleep. And while they're sleeping, whether it's physical exhaustion or a mixture of the physical exhaustion with the emotional and mental exhaustion of what Jesus has told them all throughout the last few hours, uh, some combination of both. But he says to Peter, but notice what he says to Peter, not Peter, you rock. That's what his name means. That's what Jesus said he would be called. Peter, you're a rock. No, now he goes back to his original name, Simon. Simon, are you sleeping Aren't you the guy that just said an hour ago at most? Aren't you the guy that said you'll stick by my side no matter what? How are you going to protect me if you're asleep, if you will? Could you not watch one hour? Now, you know the answer that's going to be given, which is no answer at all. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. Again he went away, prayed and spoke the same words, that is, to his heavenly Father. When he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, uh, weighed down. I have some sympathy for that. I've been in some of those situations, haven't you? Uh, you know, no matter your best efforts to the contrary, it just seems like your eyelids are made of concrete. You can't hold them open. They did not know what to answer him. He didn't ask them anything this time, or at least if he did, uh, Jesus isn't recorded as giving any uh, particular question to them, but probably all it took was a look. Uh, my just kind of inquisitive mind wants to know, how did he wake them up? Did he just walk up and kind of clear his throat? <clears> throat> hey, boys. <clears throat> did he take and, you know, kick them with his foot, with his sandal? Uh, you know, did he take a stick? You know, I, I'm just kind of inquisitive about that. I, I don't know how he did it, but he roused them enough to say, only by a look, what he had probably said earlier, you're the guys that are going to stick with me, right? You're asleep, really? He came to them the third time, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. That is an interesting phrase, it is enough. In the original language, the word therefore enough is used here by Jesus to mean uh, the payment of a debt. And what it might mean is that what Judas has done is now put into motion. And we see that in the remainder of the chapter. Uh, but it's enough. It's been paid. 
is what it literally means. The hour has come. Things now, there's no turning back. This is it. The, hand of the Son of Man is being betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. They had boasted. But Jesus gives them an important reminder. Remember I told you that Jesus knows more about me than I know about me? I'm like Peter. Sometimes I boast. I don't really mean to, I don't think. Uh, but I like to self-congratulate myself, don't you? Uh, there are times when I like to give myself an attaboy and a pat on the back. You're a good boy. You've done well. And that's dangerous. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, even if it is minimal or even if it seems innocent enough. I'll die with you, Lord. All will deny you, but not me. What a boast. But Jesus knows more about us than we do, and in what I think is some of the most tender language anywhere in the New Testament, and without, I think, a, an angry voice, or with no sense of retaliation or ridicule, uh, Jesus spoke these words, I, I believe He spoke them tenderly in verse 38. Watch and pray. Be alert and pray. That's still good in... Uh, that's still good insight for all of us as we face each day, no matter uh, that we won't be put in this same sort of situation to deny the Lord as they did. We'll still be tempted day by day to deny the Lord. And so what's our remedy to avoid that? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. That word temptation there, uh, again, could probably be better rendered into the time of trial. Remember James chapter 1, God does not tempt anyone with evil. He's not evil. He can't do it. Uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 in what some people call the model prayer says, lead us not into temptation. And people scratch their heads saying, why would God lead us into temptation? And we have to ask Him not to do that. Uh, it's not the temptation, the solicitation that the devil makes for us to sin. Rather, it's the time of trial. And what He's even asking, and this is one of those mysteries I must admit to you, in how we wrap our minds around it, he's asking for us as God's children to ask God as his children to be merciful to us even when he knows there are times when we need to be tested. And so watch and pray lest you enter into temptation now. And here's the important point. Here's the tender reminder to these men and maybe especially pointed at Peter but to the rest who had made the same uh, declaration of their faithfulness and fidelity. The spirit indeed is willing. Well, what spirit? It's not speaking, of course, of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit as God is perfect in all of His ways. But probably the Spirit here uh, is a reference to the Spirit of these men, to their mindset, to their spiritual outlook and desires. The Spirit indeed is willing. You made your confident boast. Peter, I'm sure you tried to flatter me by saying... I will be with you even if I have to die right alongside of you. And Peter, I believe you probably in your heart of hearts, in your uh, deepest recesses of your mind, you felt a full conviction and commitment that you'd do that. But Peter, I'm here to tell you, the Spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh, you're housed within flesh. You're a jar of clay, to use Paul's words when he writes to the Corinthians. You're a jar of clay, Peter, and your flesh is weak. Tonight, that still describes all of us. And we need to remember that. Because too often, maybe we unmercifully beat ourselves up, so to speak. When our pride at thinking that, you know, we're going to really do well turns into the disappointment of failure again, we say, well, I messed up, and I'm bad, and I'm not a good person, I'm not a good Christian, and it's always I and I and I. And yet the emphasis of God's Word is always on Him. It's always on God and His graciousness and His mercifulness. The way that He would say Jesus in John 15, as we abide in Him, then we can do things. Without Him we can do nothing. And thankfully He remembers what we are. God knows our many weaknesses. And we rejoice at the same time that He has none. And so we can put our trust in Him. Uh, there's just one verse in Psalm 103 that is so uh, amazing in this connection, and I don't have it on screen for you, but if you want to write it in your notes or maybe put it as a cross-reference in your Bible, in Psalm 103, as the psalmist praises uh, God for a variety of things, uh, David says that it is God who forgets 
uh, who, uh, who we are not to forget for His many benefits. It's God who forgives all of our iniquities. It's God who heals all of our diseases, who redeems our life from destruction. And it's God who has that kind of mercy, you remember, that stretches from the east to the west. And that's a beautiful. All 22 verses of this psalm need to be considered. I only want to, to highlight verse 14. David says, For he, God, knows our frame. Frame. He knows our physical body. He remembers that we are dust. He remembers what he made us out of. Dirt. Weakness. Now that's not to say that we do not have an immortal soul within us created in God's image. We most certainly do. We are dual beings. And to have the privilege of being made in God's image is... Uh, beyond compare, but to know that we are still in this flesh, in this body of clay, in this body of dust or dirt. That's what we are now in this life. And no matter as willing as our spirits are, sometimes our flesh is still weak. Thus we need the grace and mercy of God and His love and abundance. That's why we need to give it to each other. The very idea sometimes that I'm not merciful and gracious and loving to other people flies in the face of what God does for me and how He treats me. I need to remember that you are but dust. You need to remember that I am but dust. You need to remember that my spirit is willing, but sometimes my flesh is weak. I need to remember sometimes that your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. That would revolutionize the way that we treat each other. And so we should keep that ever in mind. But these men... When Jesus needed them most, they're asleep. Notice Jesus comes to them three times. Jesus told Peter, you'll deny me three times. We'll see that later in the chapter, later on this year as the Lord wills and we continue our study. But just a lot of interesting parallels. But he said, I know. Jesus understands. And he knew that by what he was about to accomplish, that that would help us. That that would be the remedy for the willingness, of our fle- or the willingness of our spirits that are often defeated by the weakness of our flesh. I'm so thankful tonight that we have that hope in Jesus. What are the applications? Let me give you three very rapidly. Number one, how prone are we to stumbling and failing despite our desires to do better? Don't you realize and feel that? I know that I do, sometimes to the very core of my being. I think I mentioned it maybe to the Bible study class uh, this morning uh, at that hour. I don't think I did in the worship time. I may have, but neither, nevertheless, remember Romans 7. Paul said, what I'm doing in verse 15, I don't understand. Now, does that mean that he was having a moment of temporary insanity? No. He just says, I find myself doing the same, if you'll allow me to use the word, the same foolish, stupid stuff over and over and over again. Been there? I do. I have. I've got the t-shirt as well. Uh, He said, what I'm doing I don't understand. For what I will to do, that is what I want to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that I do. Feel that. I've known that. And you have too. The good, verse 19, that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. How prone we are to stumbling. How easy it is to fall. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Despite our desires to do better, we still sometimes find ourselves asleep on the job like these men were when we were supposed to be watching with our Savior. Number two, our best spiritual intentions are still challenged by the weakness of our flesh. You may say it's just saying the same thing twice in a different way. Well, if it is, it's for emphasis because we need to recall that. We need to really internalize that. Our best spiritual intentions are still challenged by the weakness of our flesh. There's never a point where by my pride, even though I've made the mistake of doing so, which further illustrates the very need that I'm trying to illustrate, there's never a point when I can say, I've done it, I've made it, I've arrived. God, look at me. That point's not arrived in my life and it's not arrived in yours either. And it won't. And the only hope we have is to stand before Him uh, covered by the blood of His Son and to be washed and made clean by our Savior. That's the only hope we have. That's the only basis for pride. No wonder then Paul would say a little bit later uh, in Galatians chapter 6, he said, if I'm going to boast, he said, I'll boast in something. I'll brag. What will it, Paul? On your preaching, on your eloquence, on your learned, uh, you know, 
understanding of the Judaism uh, traditions. Paul, what will you boast on? He said, I'll boast only in this, Christ Jesus and Him crucified. May we boast only in the same even this evening likewise. And then finally, number three, did you miss it? I trust that you did because I purposely kind of designed the lesson where you would, but we missed verse 28, didn't we? Go back and look at it again. I just read over it very rapidly, but verse 28 doesn't need to be left out of this context. Jesus said, you're all going to deny me. You're going to stumble. We focused on Peter saying, no, not me. The rest join in. No, not us. Oh, well, we're asleep on the job. We want to do better, but we don't. We can't. What hope do we have? We have hope because of what verse 28 previews. Jesus said, but after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. What's about to happen? Yeah, sinful man is coming. The hour of darkness has arrived. My betrayer, verse 42, is at hand. Uh, it deserves maybe just a passing notice. Uh, we won't really do it, but we'll maybe do it when we get to verse 43 and following. Jesus could have ran away. Jesus could have very easily done anything to these men who tried to come out and supposedly exercise their power and authority over him. He could have zapped them, uh, to put it very mildly, but at least he could have run away. But he does. He says, my betrayer is at hand. And he goes out even before Judas could come in all the way into the garden to meet him. So the courage of Jesus is on full display. Why? Because he went to the cross resolute, knowing, verse 28, after I have been raised... And that will even play into what we say next week in his prayer. In his prayer, he will plead with the Father about the events upcoming. But he will leave that time of pleading with the Father with even greater determination. And here he pre merely previews it. After I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Yes, you'll fall. Yes, you'll stumble. Yes, you will desert me. But that failure doesn't have to be final. Please hear me when I say that. Hear Jesus when He says that. Our failures do not have to be final. I've known, I don't know the number of cases. I don't keep a record, at least a written record. But just in my mind, uh, I can think of some individuals uh, throughout my preaching time. And those of you that have, uh, you know, been here for a long enough period of time, you can probably think of individuals that you know too who live the Christian life for a while. And maybe because of struggles they had before they were Christians trying to overcome those or maybe something that, you know, just kind of uh, happened to them after they even became children of God. There was some difficulty. There was some adversity. There was some failure on their part. And it may have been a magnificent failure, as we would call it. But that failure doesn't have to be final. It doesn't have to be the last word because we serve a merciful, compassionate, gracious, loving Father who's willing if we allow Him to help us. We serve a Savior who even these men who were asleep when He needed them most, He said, I'm going before you to Galilee. And when He's resurrected, you remember what happens? You have to turn to chapter 16 to find out what happens. He tells Mary, He said, you go back and tell them what I told them before. I'm going before them to Galilee and I expect them to meet me. Their failure, I'm not going to hold against them. They still have a job to do. They still have work to do. And because I've died on their behalf, I'll equip them to do it. And that's the same message He gives you tonight. Failure doesn't have to be final. Jesus has died for you. He has defeated death on your behalf. You may have forsaken Him, and all of us have from time to time. Don't think for a moment that I'm boasting and saying, well, look at Peter, uh, what a sorry excuse for a follower of Jesus he was. Or look at the other ten, how pitiful they were in the hour of trial. That's not what this preacher is saying. This preacher is saying, I was right there with him doing the very same thing. But my God was merciful to me just like He was to them. He'll be merciful to you tonight if you turn to Him in obedience. If you are not a Christian, realize that He died for you, and again, He defeated death on your behalf. If you'll believe in Him and put your trust in Him so much so that you express your faith by being immersed, baptized in water, He'll wash away your every sin, make you His child, add you to His family, the church. We'll help you do that tonight. Many of us have done that, and so this lesson, especially to us, as it applies to those men who were already following Him, I hope is pointed and when you've forsaken Him, and you have, and if you've not, you will, because the flesh is weak. The Spirit is willing. Oh, I know your intentions are good, just like mine. But the Spirit, even though it's willing, the flesh is weak. And tonight, if your flesh is weak and you need forgiveness, you need strength, prayers to your Heavenly Father and the support and encouragement of your brothers and sisters in Christ can help you. 
But the Savior has died to make it possible for you to be brought back to Him again. If we can help you in doing that, the invitation a song is selected. Please come as we stand as we sing together. Free Christ, you